Welcome to the Women Changing the World podcast, a podcast on a mission to bring you some of the most amazing women I know who are doing incredible things to generally make the world a better place. From corporate sustainability to straight up magic and everything in between, you'll meet the real life humans who are birthing the new. I'm your host, Liz Best, and I'm here to amplify the stories and voices of women who are changing the world. Today, I am seriously so thrilled to introduce you to Emily Ann Brandt. Emily is someone that I have learned a ton about decolonization from over the past year, both as a member of the Decolonized Coach community and student of her course and roundtable. I absolutely love her approach to -to down-to-earth manifestation, decolonizing wealth, abundance practices, and so much more. Emily Ann Brandt is an Indigenous writer, speaker, and mentor working at the intersection of personal development and decolonization. She is Turtle Clan from the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty First Nation. Emily is on a mission to decolonize the personal development and coaching industry and works with coaches, leaders, and all types of therapists and healers to create more inclusive spaces. At the heart of it all is fostering communities where everyone feels seen, safe, and truly supported so that we can grow and rise together. In this conversation, we talk about Emily's own journey, including the experience that inspired her to start teaching decolonization for coaches and space holders, where to begin if you are feeling called to deepen in your own decolonization work and the role that perfectionism plays in that manifestation and money through a decolonized lens, and how Emily has grown and continues to grow her business with an indigenized turtle medicine approach. This conversation covers so many important topics that are so close to my heart and so critical for the work that so many of us are doing. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hi, Emily. I am so excited to have you here on the Women Changing the World podcast today. We have so much to talk about, but before we get into all the things, would love to invite you to say hi and maybe briefly introduce yourself to our listeners. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. And um, say go, say wagwago. Hello, everyone. My name is Emily. I use she, her pronouns, and uh, I usually introduce myself as an Indigenous author, mentor, and speaker from the Mohawks of the Bay of Quinty. So I'm from the Mohawk First Nation, which is part of the Haudenosaunee Six Nations here in Turtle Island or so-called Canada. And I work at the intersection of sort of decolonization meets personal development and coaching and self-development, all this good stuff that we love to talk about. So I'm sure we'll talk more about what that means, but I guess that's a little bit about me. And lately I'm sort of getting more comfortable introducing some of my other identities, such as being a disabled person and more recently a neurodivergent (laughs) ADHD person who's kind of a late life self-realization, self-diagnosis. So those are a couple of my identities. Those are, of course, more marginalized identities. And I also have um, a lot of privileges that I could name, such as being light-skinned, mixed ancestry, white presenting, able-bodied presenting, cisgendered, in a heterosexual marriage, two incomes, in our household, lots and lots of privileges I could go into as well. But I feel like for The reason I'm mentioning it for folks listening who maybe have not heard people introduce themselves in this way is I'm naming those because they are relevant to the conversation we're we're going to have around decolonization and what that looks like. Yes, I so appreciate that generous introduction and I really appreciate your setting the context for our conversation with naming those. You're someone who I've learned a lot about in terms of how and when to name the identities and the privileges that I bring to the table in my work. And 
maybe to get started, I feel like I know you have a lot on your plate these days, personally and professionally. And to give folks who are listening a little more context, would also love to hear more about what it is that you're up to and what your day-to-day looks like in this moment. Sure. Yeah. So uh, in the business in and of itself, I'm quite busy as I run a few different programs. As I said, I work at the intersection of decolonization and personal development. So mainly I help leaders, coaches, space holders to decolonize their practice and just create coaching spaces and practices that are more culturally sensitive, more inclusive, and are sort of challenging the colonial ways that are, well, I believe and I know are now crumbling as as everyone is realizing these old, outdated ways are not really serving any of us. I'm sure we'll talk more about what that means and what a decolonized approach looks like. But what that looks like from a day-to-day perspective is running a couple of different communities. One of them is the Decolonized Coach Community, which is sort of a course and an ongoing membership slash mastermind style all in one. So we have live calls every single month, twice a month. And then we have the, the course content itself, which is video modules. So all the video modules, that work's all done, but it's um, always running the community live every month. And then obviously showing up and talking about it and launching it at different times of the year. I also run a class called the round table and we do that live. It's a class and then a panel. We do that live twice a year. Um, And then I have programs on abundance and money manifestation and business growth, but from this indigenized, holistic, decolonial lens. And so that's a lot of fun. And when I'm not running those programs or marketing those programs, I'm hosting my podcast or I'm doing awesome podcast interviews like this or speaking um, engagements. And so it's very busy, but a lot of people also don't know that I have a full-time job as well. At the time of this recording, I'm a communications manager for an Indigenous relations office at a university. So working in communications is very busy. It really is a full-time job, especially um, in the month of September, because September 30th is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation in Canada. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of Indigenous-focused events and reconciliation-focused events in the month of September. So it's just a all around busy season, but I probably wouldn't have it any other way. And I really love all the things that I get to do. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that context with us. You're someone who has really inspired me and your openness about your journey of building a business while having a full-time job. I think, as you know, there are there's so many people in the online space who I know I certainly have read and seen so much about this like very harmful idea of like what it looks like to be all in on your business and in a way that I think is like really not helping anyone and obviously also can come from a place of immense privilege. And I think we need more people who are open about acknowledging the reality of like what it takes to support ourselves and exist in the world that we live in. And so I just want to say, I so appreciate you giving us all the context of who you are and what you're up to and what you're bringing to our conversation. Thank you. Yeah, that's something I get a lot of, I receive a lot of comments and appreciation for is my openness about having a full-time job while I build and grow my business. And it's funny because I didn't put it out there as this big like secret I was exposing or anything like that. I just, I always love to be transparent and share my journey and share what's going on. And when I did that, so many, so many messages flooded in like, thank you for normalizing this and sharing this and almost unshaming this because there is that such strong messaging out there that you're not really all in if you have a job as well, you know, and the reality is that without that stability in place that some people already have because of various privileges, some people really don't. Um, So obviously you have to know what's best for you, but without that stability in place, I've been there going quote unquote all in in my business and ended up completely throwing off my nervous system. And my business then became this thing that had to make money because it had to pay my bills And when you're in that survival mode, it's easy to do things that are not really in alignment, that don't really feel good, but you feel like you have to because your survival depends on it. And it just, for me, led to a really just sort of unfortunate path where I was creating things out of survival mode and not feeling aligned, not feeling inspired. And I really wanted my business to get to be something that 
is inspiring that I get to play in, that I get to do because I want to, and I want to grow that and not because I have to pay my bills. So I feel really fortunate now to be in the position that I'm in where I have this really stable, good paying job and salary and it's work that, you know, is it like my number one soul's biggest mission and purpose? No, but it's very aligned with my skills and passions and it provides stability so that my business can be this expansive, playful thing that I get to do as well. Yes. Oh, I love that so much. And it's so true. We've been having a lot of conversations about safety and nervous system regulation in my world. And they're so important just in life and especially for those of us who are entrepreneurs. Yeah. As you named, like I think what what we create from a place of safety and regulation is can be so much more fun and expansive and ironically, I find abundant. Works the best. Yeah. Yeah, It totally works the best. Yep. Yep. My business has never been bringing in more money as it has been since I've stopped needing the money. Funny how that works, right? Totally. And it's one of those things that you can't like fake your way out of or into either. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I would really love to hear more about your journey to coming to where you are in this moment. I know there have been some really interesting twists and turns along the way and that your experience has really informed what you are offering to the world now. And so really would love to invite you. Our listeners love to hear the stories of how people came to be where they are now. So please take up space and tell your story. Yeah, absolutely. I always feel a little overwhelmed by this question because it is such a sort of long story and how to summarize it even in a few minutes is difficult. But I I didn't set out starting my business thinking I was going to talk about decolonization and indigenization and reclamation of identity or anti-racism, anti-oppression, any of the things that I speak to now. I actually was given a lot of nudges to kind of go in this path and very much resisted it. Like I had a lot of imposter syndrome, like, no, I'm not the person to speak to that because of a lot of this, I think the complexities that come around identity in general and specifically having a mixed ancestry, being indigenous, but also being white presenting or white passing and growing up on a reserve, but also feeling very disconnected to the culture and the language, even though I had some of it at school because I I was fortunate enough to grow up on the reserve where, you know, at least some of our language and our, our legends and teachings were being taught at the school. But the more I kind of learned about settler colonialism and, you know, the real history that we're not exactly, most of us are not taught in school. I sort of learned on my own research in college, actually wrote my first book, shortly, either during college or shortly after college. It's a little short story book that's up on my shelf behind me back here. And it's a fictional story about a girl who attends residential school in Canada and is torn away from her family and her language and everything she knows and ends up getting sick and passing away at the school. And while it's fictional, it's based on research that I ended up doing on residential schools and is really, really a pretty realistic story is what a lot of um, what happened, unfortunately, to a lot of people. So the more I've learned about residential schools and the 60s scoop and colonialism and exactly just how brutally and how much it took away from my people, the more I'm like, well, no wonder I feel this way. No wonder I feel that imposter syndrome of not feeling Indigenous enough or not feeling cultured enough. And the more I want to sort of reclaim what my ancestors and my grandparents and my parents, my dad specifically, especially lost and the more passionate I become about that and compassionate. So how that translates into the personal development space is essentially I've been in this space for a long time. I've always been passionate about bettering myself. I've always loved the power of manifestation and the law of attraction. I grew up watching Oprah <laughs> with my mom and we both like would watch Oprah went and bought the book, The Secret, that Oprah was promoting. Both of us made vision boards, like we were so into it. But then as I sort of got older and went through real life and experienced a lot of hardships, especially around being physically disabled and being a teenager, trying to trying to fit in in high school, trying to navigate, trying to figure out who you are, 
all of that is hard enough already. And then you layer in these complexities around race and identity and then racism of going to school now off reserve and then ableism and being in this disabled, different looking body and trying to navigate that. Then teachings like, well, what you think about, you bring about, or don't argue for your limitations, argue for the life you want. Like all of these phrases that we hear in this space of manifestation and personal development, they become a little like gaslighting and a, a little like toxic positivity when you're in it, right? So I sort of stepped away from that work and kind of abandoned it, which was not great for my mental health, but I, I did because some of it was just making me mad at that time. But I ended up making my way back to those types of books and the work you know, of folks like Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield, and Louise Hay, a lot of these people who I'm now realizing were all either white men or white women, um, people who hold a lot of privileges in a lot of ways. But I made my way back to that sort of space because in my 20s, I became an entrepreneur and I joined an MLM company. And when you join an MLM company, the first thing they teach you is to do your mindset work and your personal development work and to work on your vision and holding the vision. And so I kind of got back into that, that world of the books and the podcasts and the retreats and the seminars, all of that. And I was like, oh, I forgot how much I love this stuff. And you know what? I don't want to sell these essential oils that I was selling through the company I was with. I want to just tell people what I'm learning about the power of mindset and gratitude. And also a lot of it really resonated with me because it comes from indigenous teachings. So a lot of it, we were already taught growing up the importance of gratitude. We started every day at school with the Ohondo Gari Wadekwa, which goes through and gives thanks and gives our thanks and greetings to all of creation before we do anything else. And then in Haudenosaunee culture too, we also have these three core sort of principles under the great law of peace that we live by. And it's peace, which means a lot of different things and encompasses a lot of things and strength, which really means inner strength and then a good mind. So a good mind, meaning like having a positive mindset, being grateful, that's actually deeply embedded in Haudenosaunee culture. So no wonder all these teachings were resonating with me so much, right? But here I was learning them through white men like Tony Robbins and other spiritual teachers. So anyways, but I'm like, you take what you can get, right? And you just, you kind of make the best of it. Then fast forward, I realized I wanted to be teaching on that, not on the essential oils. So then I became a coach and I realized that was a thing you could get paid for talking about this and doing this for a living. That was so, so exciting for me, especially as someone who had visions of myself speaking on big stages as a little kid. That's kind of what I would envision when I felt sad about all the challenges I had to go through. I was shown like this is going to be used to help and inspire others one day. And so realizing, oh, this could actually be a path. This could actually be something I pursue was very exciting. But then I joined the world of coaching and I hired other coaches and I joined groups and masterminds and I went on retreats. And most of these spaces were predominantly filled by, and all the ones I joined were led by white, able-bodied, cisgendered men and women. And I just thought that's kind of what my options were. And it didn't really affect me that much when I was still, before I sort of had what I'm now referring to as like my real spiritual awakening, <laughs> where I realized I had a lot of healing to do around how much I had sort of neglected my indigeneity and hadn't addressed that wound of feeling not indigenous enough, but feeling not white enough either. So essentially, I realized I had a conversation with spirit through a psychic, which sounds funny, but this is how like all my major life-changing moments have been like through psychic readings or healers or some sort of uh, very spiritual experience. So I had a conversation with spirit through a psychic and I was like, listen, I've been hustling in my business. I'm doing the affirmations. I'm doing the mindset work. I'm journaling every day how come my business isn't farther along? Like how come my peers are lapping me and I should be where they are and what's going on? And so spirit said, you have some work to do related to your self-worth and it's related to like your indigenous ancestry, like that side, your dad's lineage. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. 
all I do is work on my self-worth. Like I affirm in the mirror every single day, how worthy I am. You don't even know. Like I know I'm worthy. It's just not showing up yet. And then I said, and besides like the indigenous side, that doesn't make any sense because I think I actually said like, I'm not indigenous enough to have to heal from the pain of racism or something like that. And so even that spirit was like, well, that in and of itself is something that you need to heal. Is that not feeling indigenous enough, right? Because it obviously comes down to I am not enough. Whenever we're saying I'm not blank enough, it's really I'm not enough. So I was like, whew, that was a huge can of worms that I had just opened. And then I really committed to sitting with that and exploring that. And I sat in meditation and I said, okay, ancestors, this was really my first time connecting with ancestors. And this was... I think 2021, end of 2021 or early 2022. And I said, okay, what's here then? What needs to be healed? And oh my goodness, nothing and no one could have prepared me for that journey because what a wound to open and look at, right? So as you can imagine, all the pain of just how much Indigenous peoples have lost, how much we've been disconnected from. I sat and saw children who were mothers whose children were taken away from them, literally ripped off their laps, like so much pain, so much heartbreak. And I just went through that for like months and still sit with that pain. But I also sit with a lot of strength and wisdom. But anyways, at the time I was going through all this, I was in another a white woman's mastermind business program and essentially having this identity crisis of realizing just how much I'd pushed aside my indigeneity in order to sort of feel more accepted by society. I'd assimilated to whiteness, learned how to do that in high school and just kept on doing it because of racism. And now was having this whole reclamation, this whole like eye-opening experience, this whole emotional journey. And I brought it to the mastermind I was in at the time. And then nobody knew how to, how to hold me in that. No one knew what to do with that. So I brought it to the group chat. I said, this is what's going on. It's so, so heavy. I'm just like in it right now. I just wanted to share that with you all. And this was a super active group chat on Boxer. And if I had come in and said like, I'm feeling stuck about my mindset or this launch isn't going how I wanted, I would have had like Liz, like 20 voice note replies waiting for me from the peers, from the mentor, nothing, crickets, crickets after I left this message about like realizing how much my own identity I've pushed aside because of colonialism and white supremacy. And the mentor liked the message, like heart reacted the message. And then that was, that was it, did not respond to it. Eventually one of my close friends in the chat put a really lovely response. And then one other person put a really lovely response, just saying like, Emily, I can't imagine this and we don't know what you're, what you're experiencing, but it's a lot and we're holding you and we're witnessing you and like you let us know what you need. And that's all I needed, right? Just to be seen and validated and heard. But I realized, oh, people really don't know how to have this conversation. And it's a privilege also that I didn't have that negative experience or realize that until this moment of reclaiming all of me and bringing my indigeneity into these spaces. Because previously I was just operating as half of myself and obviously that wasn't working for me. So I need to have spaces where I can bring my whole self, including my indigeneity, the pain and the strength into these spaces. And so that's when I realized these conversations need to happen. And then I went on a retreat later that year with sort of a similar group of people. And it really solidified that, yes, this work is needed. And I guess I'm going to be the one to start talking about it. So I so appreciate you telling the full version of the story, because I have to be honest, I think about that story so often as someone who is holding space, as a white woman who is holding space. And that's just so not the experience I would ever want someone to have in my space. And There just aren't enough places yet, and I think you're creating one of them for us to have these conversations about how we can create safer spaces to have these conversations, how we can more thoughtfully and proactively and compassionately show up for each other, even and especially in situations where we can't imagine what someone is going through, but to like give people space to talk about their lived experience. Like that's how we all get better and more connected and create more love in this world. And I feel like your story is so powerful and I'm so sorry that you went through that, but I really appreciate your sharing it with us. 
Thank you. Yeah. And it started as me just kind of airing stuff out (laughs) online. And like I said, the more I did that, like my DMs became flooded with people saying, I relate to your story so much. I've had this experience of harm or I've had this experience of harm. And so many people have had so much worse experiences than what I described and yet are still afraid to speak up and say anything because there's such a strong culture of these quote unquote safe spaces, which I now like when I hear safe space, that's almost like a red flag for me (laughs) because I, what I learned was that a safe space is safe so long as we uphold white supremacy and we don't question anything and we don't question the status quo. And then as soon as someone of the global majority brings up something like colonialism or racism, the space is no longer safe because we're no longer upholding that white comfort. So that's what I'm working to change. And yeah, I've realized every day there's still people messaging me saying, please keep going. This is so needed. I've also had these experiences. Totally. Well, and I I really want to talk about the work that you are doing. It's so valuable. So maybe to start, for anyone who's not already familiar, you alluded to the fact that we would be talking more about uh, decolonization in our conversation. And I want to talk about the decolonized coaching community. But maybe let's also just define decolonization for anyone who might be listening who isn't familiar with that term um, and then would love to talk more about DCC and, and how you're doing this work, especially for coaches and healers and space holders. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you for bringing it back a little bit. So decolonization, I always say that in order to define decolonization, we have to really understand colonization and colonialism. And so it's tricky when I share online because, and I hope it's okay to share it here, even words like white supremacy. I can't say that online without my account getting shadow banned or, you know, completely disabled, right? So colonialism is really just a prettier way of saying white supremacy. If we really look at settler colonialism, so it's the process in which the folks from a more dominant culture, and well, now dominant because that's what they created, folks took over the land, the lives, the power, and the sovereignty of indigenous people, indigenous peoples of a land who literally did no harm to them. They came in and took over and decided that they were, states from Europe were in every way superior. So essentially, these people realized that there's, oh, there's different kinds of humans. There's humans with different skin color, with different languages, with different ways of thinking, with different body shapes, different body types, different foods that they eat. And because there's different types of human, there has to be a superior, there must be a superior human and it must be us. (laughs) You know, my ancestors on my mom's side, the, the Europeans. And they decided that because they are superior, they used that to justify dehumanizing anyone who was not them. And so that's why I say like really white supremacy and colonialism are the same thing because it's founded in that ideology that one group of people is superior and therefore is entitled to say that their way of life, their religion, their way of thinking and seeing the world is what's superior and therefore everyone else has to adopt and assimilate. So I I speak especially from the lens of what happened here in Turtle Island or so-called Canada and so-called United States of America because that's the land that I'm in and that I'm most familiar with. But it's happened in many, (laughs) many spaces all across the world. And it's the same brutal process and brutal dehumanizing of some humans for the gain and power and control of other humans. So when we decolonize, it's really dismantling that and dismantling the ideology behind that, that one group is superior. And because it's been so ingrained in all of us for our whole entire lifetimes, it really gets in deeply internalized by every single one of us, which is why you'll hear people saying, like anti-racism teachers saying that everyone is racist and we have to unlearn it because we really, we really do. It's so, it's everywhere. Even if you're consciously opposed to a certain idea, your subconscious is wired in with these messages and it can show up in in subtle and in not so subtle ways, but it's really wired in all of us. So decolonizing is this, most of all, it's a questioning. It's questioning everything we've ever been taught and sort of forced into. 
It's unlearning. And I like to break it down into three sort of pieces because it's not just a metaphor. I know this word decolonized is either like it's a kind of a buzzword. A lot of people are using it without fully understanding what it means. Other people hate it, find it really triggering. I know it, to me, like the word doesn't really matter that much. It's more about what are we, what are we actually doing? And so I always say decolonization is three things. It's ideas we unlearn and learn. So mindset, it's words we can speak and it's actions we can take. And it has to be all three of these things because the words are empty without action. The actions are meaningless without true unlearning and learning and understanding. Um, and I got that framework from a Squamish uh, matriarch, Tatalia Nihani. I hope I'm saying their name correctly, but I learned that framework online a while ago, written as, yeah, ideas we unlearn and learn, words we speak and actions we take. And I just thought that was such a brilliant way to kind of break it down. And I love a good framework. So as you know, that's the framework that I use for the DCC and for, for how I guide coaches through this process. Totally. And I appreciate that framework. It feels like it touches on the different ways that we can meaningfully show up in dismantling white supremacy, which itself is so insidious. Like for anyone who's listening, who's like operating in a corporate culture, like white supremacy is like such a big part of work culture in for so many of us today. And that's just one example. Obviously there are so many examples, but I feel like I've really had my eyes opened to the extent to which, as you said, Emily, it's everywhere. And there's so much unlearning and questioning for us to do. I'm curious for anyone who's listening, who's like, I would really like to get started on my decolonization journey. This is maybe newer for me. What would you recommend as an immediate step or starting point for for someone who is committed to this path and feeling a bit overwhelmed about where to start? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I like to say the first place to start is to just make peace with the fact that this is a lifelong journey of unlearning and learning. That's really like making acceptance with that, especially because of the colonial sort of society that we live in, we're used to this instant gratification of, well, can I just take a weekend course and get certified? Or can I just like read this book and then I can check? I read, I learned that, got it done. And it's not that simple, unfortunately, because like I said, we've been learning it our whole lives. It's going to take the rest of our whole lives to unlearn it. So I think just making peace with that. And the first thing, as you know, that I guide folks through inside the Decolonized Coach, used to be course, now community, is unlearning perfectionism, which is another thing that the patriarchy and colonialism has sort of forced upon us, especially those of us socialized as women, is that this need to be perfect, to be right, and to be good. And to to do that, we are required to not question the authorities that are in place, the systems, the structures that are in place, who's in power and why and what's been normalized. And questioning that makes us wrong and bad. And I learned from Regina Jackson and Syra Rao, who have a really great book called White Women, Everything, Liz is nodding, yes, it's a really good book, Everything You Already Know About Your Own Racism and How to Do Better. And it really talks a lot about, especially women and white women's need to be right and good, or rather good. But it so well explains that there's a difference between doing what's nice versus what's actually kind. And kindness is doing the right thing, even if it makes others uncomfortable. Whereas niceness is, oh, well, I didn't want to make a scene or make things awkward. So I stayed silent when this indigenous person in my mastermind went out on a limb and shared their experience of racism and having to assimilate and losing their culture. But everyone else was silent and I didn't want to make it awkward. So I stayed silent too, rather than chiming in and making that person feel less alone or I stayed silent instead of calling out my uncle for making a really inappropriate racist comment at the Thanksgiving dinner. That's being nice, but it's not being kind because kindness is doing what's actually right for the person that's being impacted, often at the expense of your own comfort. So the journey is uncomfortable for sure. And perfectionism and decolonization cannot coexist. So it's like unlearning that and unlearning that it's not actually wrong to be imperfect and to be learning and to, just to be okay with learning. And I'm, I'm always the first to say that I'm also, 
have so much to learn and I'm, I'm going to be learning until the day that I stop breathing. Right. So, and then I'll go learn in the spirit world. <laughs> so just normalizing that and unlearning perfectionism, I think is the best place to start. I really appreciate that. And I feel like something that I've really appreciated the way that you model is this idea of we're not always going to get it right. We're going to do our best. For those of us who are running online businesses, like there may be words that we've used in the past in our marketing or social media or on our websites that we would never use now because we know better. But taking like the shame out of that and celebrating the learning and the evolution is so important for making this work feel sustainable. But as you said, it so requires detaching from that perfectionism. Yeah. And it is ongoing work. (laughs) It is something you have to continually check in on, but you know, the work is so rewarding and it's so, it does so much good for your own self. Everyone gets free when we free ourselves of these shackles of perfectionism and just obeying and not questioning status quo and trying to, yeah, trying to get it right all the time when that's just not possible and language is always evolving and we're always evolving and learning. So yeah, it really provides a lot of grace and space when you can just accept that it's a, it's a learning journey and just be open about that. Totally. Well, the one other big topic that you alluded to earlier in our conversation that I feel like we'd be remiss not to talk a little bit about is down to earth manifestation, as you call it, or decolonizing wealth and abundance practices. It's so refreshing to hear the way you talk about this. I think it's so needed. I would love to hear what inspired you to offer programs that are more focused on the money side of things. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I've always been passionate about business growth and money manifestation, of course, who doesn't like growing their money, right? And I think that's why a lot of us get into these journeys of personal development. And those coaching spaces is one of one of the main goals people have is making more money. But I also know that that's such an emotionally charged topic. And so many of us have money stories and beliefs around money and almost like emotional scarring around money and so many layers and complexities. And when I was working on sort of my money mindset, I guess is what you could call it or what they call it. I noticed there was this common theme of all the teachers telling us to sort of just shift our limiting beliefs, just shift our limiting beliefs around money, right? Like you have to go all in, you have to bet on yourself, believe in your vision, hold your belief vision if you have any beliefs that you know money's not possible for you or this wealth isn't possible for you then you have a scarcity mindset is what it was often called and i did my best not to have a scarcity mindset and <laughs> to to do all the positive affirmations around money and embrace money is so great and i'm best friends with money and i'm going to be super rich and it, well it does ignore the real like like i say down to earth real barriers First of all, like systemic barriers, institutional barriers, financial barriers that people actually have. But it also ignores the way that our nervous systems are wired differently. So one example of that, which we talked about earlier, is like going all in in your business without a uh, something to fall back on. I mean, there's so much I can say on this. First of all, there's so many different privileges in what that going all in actually could look like, right? Could be someone actually you know, their husband's going to pay all the bills anyway, or they have support from their parents, or they have a ton of money in savings and they have a ton of wealth knowledge and how to invest in what portfolios to look at. And they know all of this versus somebody who doesn't have those things and actually would be putting it all on the line. Even if two people were both equally putting it all on the line because of ancestral trauma, because of intergenerational trauma and different walks of life that people come from, our nervous systems are wired differently. Our DNA is different. We actually carry forward the trauma and the things that happened to our ancestors, but we're not always taught that in these manifestation spaces. So going all in for someone whose ancestors have had everything literally ripped from out from under them is very different experience than for someone whose ancestors have always gotten <laughs> exactly what they wanted and had always knew how to take up space and take what's theirs and then some, right? It's literally in our DNA. So I think that conversation just wasn't happening enough. And probably that's why a lot of those spaces and money manifesting programs weren't really working for me. I mean, also when I went to talk about these experiences of 
growing up on a First Nations Nations reserve, seeing how a lot of people don't like don't like money because of what has been done in the name of money to our people, right? Even though it's not the money itself that did the bad things, it was done in the name of greed and wealth. So there's just a lot to reconcile. And a lot of these spaces like to like to just slap on this toxic positivity and kind of ignore and act like all these complex layers and things aren't here, but they are. They are here. And so once I actually just let myself acknowledge that these are here, there's some ancestral healing to do. There's some real life things to take into consideration. There's some real practical knowledge and tips that I have to get that I have to figure out and that I have to share with others and combine that with the power of, yes, manifestation and spirit. It's a real thing. Energy is a real thing. My people know this. We've always known this. Indigenous folks are the original like manifestors. Um, but it all has to come together holistically. And then I realized, oh my goodness, if you look at the uh, medicine wheel, which we have from our Anishinaabe siblings, and you look at it, it shows that we must have, it's a, it's a wheel if you've not seen it, it's called the medicine wheel. Usually it's called the medicine wheel. It's got four quadrants on it, representing different seasons, different cycles of life, many things, but also kind of the four aspects of our being, which is mind, body, spirit, and emotion. And I was like, oh my goodness, the answers are right here in our medicine wheel. Like, yes, we need mindset. Yes, we need the spirit. Yes, we need to look at the real emotions that are here and the traumas. And we need the body, the physical, the 3D, like what are the actual practical skills and knowledge that we need to build wealth? And so I think that's oftentimes missing. I think the looking at the real sort of intergenerational and ancestral stuff that can come in, the racial stuff that can layer in the privilege, um, privileges or marginalized identities and look at all of that holistically when we look at manifesting money. And since doing that, which I kind of had to do it on my own because there wasn't programs out there that were addressing all of those things that's when the real money started coming in for me. So now that's the lens through which I teach money and business growth. Thank you for sharing how you tie all of that together. It's such a beautiful example, I think, of how some of the most brilliant ideas sound obvious in hindsight, but like were not obvious at the time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) As you're describing it, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, this makes so much sense. And yet no one was thinking about it in this way. And it's so important that you're doing this work to bring these pieces together and to bring in the body and the 3D and the tactical, practical aspect of this that actually can make it real. It's funny too, because there's a lot of debates that happen between different people who focus on just the strategy and the practical. And then there's the people who are like, no, all that matters is energy and mindset. And the rest, like, yeah, you kind of need it, but not really. And there's almost this like war against each other. And then there's the somatic people who are like, no, everything's about the body. And each of them has their value. And I've also been sort of in different phases in my business where I've been like first I thought it was all mindset. And then I was like, no, it's not, it's not mindset. We need to go out of that and go more into our spirit. Like I've been in all kind of in all of the quadrants. And so it's really funny being like, oh wait, the answer is all of it. We need all of it. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yes. That sounds so much like my journey too. I feel like I started very much in the like mindset spiritual. And then I like panicked and was like, I need more strategies. I need all the tactical. And then it was like, this feels awful. Like, why does this feel so bad? (laughs) Yeah, it's not how we were meant to be. And indigenous wisdom, of course. I'm always like, of course, ancestors had the answers. Mm, (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Well, I know that you've really approached your business growth with an indigenized turtle medicine lens or with a turtle medicine approach. Yeah. And it sounds like even just hearing you describe it, it feels so peaceful in my body. So I would love to hear more about it and how it feels both in your body and in your business. Yeah, thank you. So turtle medicine is what I refer to um, a lot. It's uh, the idea of slowing down to speed up and kind of learning this beautiful wisdom from our friend, the turtle, who operates slow and steady. And of course, we have the classic story. Most of us have have heard in childhood, the tortoise and the hare. If you've not heard that story, basically, there's a race between the tortoise 
and a hare or a rabbit and the turtle's just taking one step at a time, going slow. And the rabbit's like, oh, I got this. This turtle's so slow. So it's clearly in, you know, in first place, clearly winning. It takes off the fastest and then looks back and sees how much far ahead, farther ahead it is and then starts like dilly-dallying because it's so confident that he's going to win. And then by the time it looks back to what they're doing, the, the turtles crossed the finish line because it didn't stop, but it just went at, he went at his own pace. And um, so slow and steady wins the race. That's kind of where that, I'm very much paraphrasing the story, but that's where that saying comes from. And to me, that's what embodying turtle medicine is. It's just going at your own pace, putting one foot in front of the other and kind of tuning out the noise that tells you, you've got to build a six figure business in six months. And your first launch has got to be this huge, like flashy launch and you got to grow really fast. And for a long time, I very much tried to fit myself into that mold and operate in that way and thought something was wrong with me when I couldn't. But I found so much peace since embracing this medicine of the turtle and going at my own pace, even though I am very busy and I have a lot on the go, having this job that I work, the stable job alongside growing my business, it allows me to take off that pressure to grow my business in a good way. And it feels almost like construction where you're like, you know, I'd rather have my construct, I'd rather have a house that's built carefully and intentionally brick by brick versus the contractors who come in and cut corners and later things are going to fall apart, right? It's the same thing in our business. Like I'd rather lay this foundation now with deep roots that are so like carefully thought out, so well-intentioned, so aligned. I've been in the place of very much when in that hustle and force, like building stuff that's not aligned for sure. So like no shame on anyone who's done that or is maybe dealing with that right now. I feel like we've all been there because of the pressure of our society is like, go, go, go. You just got to get there faster. But yeah, embracing this way of the turtle has allowed me to build something that I'm like so proud of. I'm having so much fun building. And I know I'm setting myself up for this deep rooted, like long game success and just fulfillment. Yeah, totally. That's so beautiful to hear. I actually, last year, 2023 was like a roots year for me and my business. Mm -hmm. And it is, I love that. thank you. Yeah. It's such a different energy. I think when we give ourselves permission to let things unfold at the pace that feels good, as opposed to this yeah. idea, which is not ours, but exists of like growth at all costs as fast as possible. Yeah, exactly. Well, I could talk to you for hours. I so deeply appreciate you coming onto the podcast to share your wisdom. Again, I feel like there's so much more we could talk about. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> the last thing I wanted to make sure to ask is for people who are listening, who want to find you, follow you, keep up with you, learn from you, where is the best place or are the best places for people to do so? Yeah. Thanks so much. And thanks everybody for tuning in today. You can connect with me. I'm usually most active on Instagram in terms of social media. So I'm at Emily Ann Brandt and it's E-M-I-L-Y-A-N-N-E. B-R-A-N-T. And then I'm my website's emilyannbrandt.com. My podcast is the Soul's Way podcast. And I think I have a Facebook group as well, but I think those are kind of the main channels. You can always find everything on my website anyway. So I'll just leave that there for folks. Thank you so much. And you also have um, a round table coming up this fall, which is something I found so valuable. And you'll be opening up enrollment for the Decolonized Coach community. So also would invite you if there's details on those that you want to share. We'll definitely include links to both in the show notes for anyone who wants to go deeper and learn more from Emily. Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm sometimes a really bad self-promoter. So thank you for that nudge. Yes. The round table will be coming back live again. And this is always such a powerful, it's a two-part class where the first day is like a 90 minute presentation. I actually not decided yet if it's going to be a co-presentation again, or if it's going to just be myself, likely a co-presentation um, with one of my recent collaborators and co-facilitators, Melinda Jackson. They are just amazing. And then the second day is a panel where you get to hear from different leaders and coaches and people in this industry who are of the global majority, which is a term we didn't discuss today, but it's a sort of a term to replace BIPOC 
or ethnic minorities because we actually make up the global majority of people. So you get to hear from all sorts of brilliant leaders. And then you also get to hear more details about the decolonized coach course, which, yeah, is our signature, my signature community where you really go on a deep dive into implementing these practices in your business to decolonize step by step and going over those three sort of frameworks, mindset, words, and actions, and then having community while you do it, because that's the piece that makes it sustainable. So we can put the links to you to learn more about the DCC and also the roundtable for sure. Awesome. We definitely will um, highly, highly recommend for anyone listening. Both of those are just amazing. Thank you again so much, Emily. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much, Liz. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. Please rate and review the podcast wherever you're currently listening to it. And don't forget to subscribe for future episodes. You can find me on Instagram at liz.best, that's L-I-S dot B-E-S-T. And you can find Girls Club Collective at girls underscore club underscore collective. You can also find us on LinkedIn by searching for Liz Best, that's my name, L-I-S, B-E-S-T, and Girls Club Collective. Join our mail list by visiting the Girls Club Collective homepage and scrolling down to the bottom. You'll be in the loop on upcoming events, retreats, and opportunities to make magic with us, and you'll also receive a monthly love note from my heart to your inbox. I am so excited to keep in touch.